I'm very glad to welcome you to the ERN Eurobonnet Thursday webinar. That is one of the education and online program of the ERN. Normally, this program is held every Thursday at 5 p.m. You can find on our website the past webinars and on our YouTube channels also the recorded video of the past webinars. And today we are going to speak about the management of black fan diamond anemia in adults. With us, there is a doctor. Thierry Leblanc, and I'm very glad to uh, introduce him. So he's training in Paris at the Faculté de Médecine Saint-Antoine, Paris, and he's registered as a pediatrician and hematologist. His main interest is non-malignant hematology. His clinical practice includes constitutional and acquired aplastic anemia, other inherited blood disorder except sickle cell disease, and autoimmune blood cytopenias. He runs pediatric and adult outpatients clinics in Hôpital Robert Debré and Hôpital Saint-Louis. He's part of the leading team of the French National Reference Center for Aplastic Anemia and the Inherited Bone Marrow Failure Syndromes. He's also deeply involved in training and education in his field. So, Dr. Leblanc, the floor is to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Pellegrini. And uh, it's a pleasure for me for, to speak about DBA, which is maybe one of my favorite rare diseases uh, currently. I have no conflict of interest. Uh, so the learning objective are to think about DBA in adult patients and to know how to diagnose it, to know how to treat DBA in adult patients, and to know how to follow adult patients with DBA. Uh, briefly, uh, you can say that DBA is a quite rare disease. Uh, the current uh, incidence is supposed to be five to seven uh, cases per one million live birth in Europe and also in the US, more or less the same numbers. We do think that uh, maybe it's a little higher because we have recently much more cases than uh, expected because of the genetic testing and, and the fact that we are able to diagnose DBA in more and more non-classical uh, situations. It's the main cause of constitutional erythroblastopenia. It's also a ribosomopathy and uh, actually the leader uh, in this field, in this group of disease uh, we will talk about. Uh, it, it's always not really understood uh, why uh, DBA is mostly red cell disease because uh, ribosome is very important for every kind of cell, but we have not really explanation for this. The genetic transmission is mostly autosomic dominant, but it's not so simple. We have uh, the problem of cell and carrier. We have also other kinds of genetic transmission reported. And overall, this disease is very heterogeneous, uh, both uh, for genetic and clinical aspects. So it's a ribosomopathy, and uh, we know that uh, in DBA, you can evidence a defect in the maturation processing of uh, ribosomal RNA. And actually, it's the multi-step uh, procedures. And for a specific defects, for example, for RPS24, you can identify uh, the step which is impaired in uh, DBA. And at the end, at the end, you have a defect in ribosomal biosynthesis, and uh, it's a kind of haploinsufficiency. here. You have less ribosomes, less translation, and uh, therefore a disease, especially in red cells. So what are the clinical presentation? You have a lot of them. Uh, obviously, you can have a patient with a severe of mild anemia. Uh, the anemia is macrocystic uh, with low reticulocyte counts. And if you have a very severe anemia, you may have uh, erythroblastopenia at the bone marrow respiration. If not, you will have only reduced number of uh, red cell progenitors. You can also have a patient with hyperglobulin. You may have a woman with a complicated pregnancy with more severe anemia than expected, a baby with uh, congenital abnormalities. 
you may have uh, asymptomatic patient. For instance, uh, when you do a genetic test in a family, you, you may find some patient with uh, a mutation present with and no phenotype. You may have patient with MDS-like feature or also a true MDS, if, if I can say, with blast excess and the clonal events. And you may also have a patient with solid tumors. And the uh, one point is that this patient may have an unexpected uh, severe uh, toxicity of chemotherapy with uh, red cell transfusion need uh, in a, for a treatment uh, usually not so uh, severe regarding the bone marrow impact. So you have to think to DBI in a very different uh, clinical situation. And if you think about the diagnosis, you may have different way to confirm it. Uh, just before, this is an example of case which uh, has been published recently in a patient, uh, adult patient, 44, 44, five years old. And you see there is a quite severe anemia with macrocytosis. We don't have press, uh, previous blood counts. Maybe this patient has a milder anemia before and the anemia uh, became more uh, severe on the other spontaneously or because of a infectious disease, for instance. Obviously, it was more easy because you have uh, ends problems, as you can see. Uh, this is example of blood counts uh, can, you can see in DBA patient. Uh, this is a, pa a woman born in uh, 1965, and she is in therapeutic independence. As you can see, the hemoglobin level are subnormal, not very low. You, you do have a macrocytosis, and uh, in, on some blood counts, you have also a mild uh, neutropenia. At the contrary, platelet counts are normal, and this is usually the case in adult DBA patient. Uh, the plat platelet lineage is very well uh, conserved. This is another example. This patient is a man more or less of the same age. Uh, he is on small dose of steroid, and uh, he used to be transfused, and it, wa it was part of a clinical trial of uh, Abcovid, published in Blood. It's a passion one in the paper, if you want to, to look at it. And they did have a complete uh, hematologic response of metoclopramide. He kept this treatment for years, and fin finally I stopped the treatment. Now it's only prednisone. And on prednisone only, he has normal blood counts, macrocytosis, normal neutrophil counts in this patient, and once again, platelet counts are very normal. So how to confirm the diagnostic? Uh, fetal hemoglobin is a good screening test because it's not specific of DBA, but in many bone marrow failure syndrome, you do have a rise in hemoglobin fetal, and this is suggestive of inherited disease. So very easy to do, very quick to have a result. The second point is the erythrocyte deaminase. It's quite more difficult because, because very few labs uh, do this uh, enzyme activity. Uh, in France, we have only one lab in Paris and uh, not in you know, any place in the country. And the second point is you have to do this test before any transfusion. And if not, you have to wait at least three months, which is very difficult on a, for a patient uh, who is on regular transfusion. But if you can do this, you may uh, have a rise in this enzyme activity and is very suggestive of DBA. A ribosomal RNA analysis is not once again in the current practice, but uh, in some lab you can do this and maybe in the future it will be also a very good uh, screening test. I know that the Italian group has a good result with that and we are working on it also in France. Uh, in a patient with a macrocytic anemia, uh, if you find uh, hypogamma globulinemia, it's also suggestive of DBA because once again, it's a very frequent uh, feature in adult uh, patients with DBA. The other diagnostic is Dadadu syndrome, but mostly in children. Once again, a quite easy screening test. And then you do the bone marrow. And uh, actually, in uh, if you have a bone marrow, uh, the typical bone marrow of DBA, it's erythroblastopenia. But if you have a less severe anemia, you may have only a reduced number uh, of uh, erythrocyte precursors. There is no dysplasia. And if yes, it's not normal and you have to think to a clonal event, there is no sideroblast. And overall, the bone marrow is rich and over lineage are normal. The question of bone marrow biopsy is, uh, is depend on your practice. In France, we do not do bone marrow biopsies. In some countries, they, they do. I don't think it's very useful. And it may explain why some 
in some cases, uh, some people speak about bon marrow aplasia in DBA. Actually, in 40 years, I never see a patient with very severe pancytopenia. But what you look at the bone marrow biopsy, you may have very poor bone marrow. But who cares? If you have normal blood counts, who cares? So I don't think bone marrow biopsy is very useful, but once again, it depends on your practice. And lastly, you can do the genetic test. Uh, to note, you can also look at EPO, and EPO is very, very high. DBA is maybe the disease in which you have the highest levels of EPO. Uh, the genetic tests are obviously very useful. This is uh, from the paper we recently published in blood. In blood, uh, as you know, the main gene is RPS19, about 25% uh, of patients. And you have currently about 20 genes, all involved more or less in uh, the ribosomal biogenesis. So you can see the respectively uh, respect frequencies of all these genes. And you have some other genes not directly involved in uh, ribose ribosome biogenesis. Uh, GATA1, I will speak about this, EPO, and uh, also uh, ATA2. So currently, we are able to find a mutation in about 80% uh, of patients. Uh, you have to do both NGS and uh, CGHRA because you have about 20, 15 to 20% of patients who do have large deletion. So you can miss phase deletion by NGS. And uh, most of the genes are RP genes and the transmission is autosomic dominant. And one gene uh, is involved in ribosome biogenesis, but it's not uh, a structural protein of a ribosome and the transmission is, is X-linked. I will talk about this uh, over gene. And uh, just to remind you, uh, about 96% of identified mutations are uh, among these uh, six genes. So you, the most important to remind. And also, large deletions are very frequent in some genes, and they are uh, indicated here. For 20% of patients, we do not find any mutation. So now we currently practice exome in trio. If you look at the different uh, constitutional erythroblastopenia, uh, you have a problem of GATA1. GATA1 is a gene uh, which is said to be a DBA gene by some and not by others. Uh, we don't. We do not have any patient in the front registry, which is the biggest in uh, number in in, in Europe. Uh, it's also the case in the German group. In the Italian uh, registry, they found one patient only, and I think there is two patients in uh, the US group. Uh, this gene has been linked to different hematological phenotypes, as you can see here, but a few uh, DBA-like patients, at least. Uh, have mutation in these genes, and maybe there are very specific mutations, and uh, specifically uh, mutations uh, in which you have only one transcript, uh, with the short one, and what the long is a form of uh, the transcript of this gene. So it's more or less a nosologic problem, but in any case, we systematically look at this gene in the NGS. This gene is responsible for Dadadu syndrome. It's a much more severe uh, disease. It's an autosomic uh, recessive uh, transmission. And a very good screening test is a uh, IgG level because you have a very early and severe hypogamma globulinemia. And this patient may have a very severe clinical course, but it's more a problem in children than in adults. Uh, sorry, I said EPO, it's EPO receptor actually. Uh, you have only one family with uh, two cases and a mutation in the gene of uh, the EPO receptor. And uh, we have also two cases uh, with activating mutation of TP53, which is very unusual. And uh, it, the phenotype is much more like a telomeropathy phenotype but this patient uh, did have a very severe erythroblastopenia 
and it's very interesting because we know that in DBA, you have an activation of a TP53 pathway, and this is a natural ex example of act activation of this pathway. Uh, the question of Keta1, once again, uh, you have this nice paper in natural medicine, and uh, they demonstrate that uh, actually, whatever the mutation of uh, DBA found, you have a decrease of the translation of GATA1. So this may be a kind of common event in DBA. So maybe GATA1 is a DBA genes. Once again, it's a disc current discussion. If you consider now the treatment, we have the two main options are transfusion. Uh, the current guidelines say that the threshold must be 19 to 100 gram uh, per liter. Liter, sorry. And uh, usually that's mean two to three red cell units every three to four weeks. I think the quality of life is very important because this patient may have a quite normal life, but they do need a correct level of hemoglobin. And uh, a very unusual point is that some DBA patient still have a relatively correct level of reticulocytes and uh, some of my patients need transfusion only every two to three months which is not classical for a patient on red cell support, but good thing for them. The other option is uh, steroids. And uh, in children, we start uh, at two milligrams per kilogram in order to have a rise in reticulocytes. In adults, we consider that the maximal dose must be 80. We have no many evidence to say that we have to start at this level of dose for every patient, but it is the current practice and everybody, everyone do the same. Uh, but if you do have a rise of reticular seat, you can decrease very fast the steroid. You don't need to have this uh, level of uh, dose for a long time. So at, as soon as you have a rise in reticular seat around te te uh, 10 days of steroids, you can begin to decrease. And then you try to define the minimal efficacy dose. And DBA is very specific, uh, especially in children. You, you may have children with very good response, normal level of hemoglobin with 0.05 milligram per kilogram, for instance. And if you take off this uh, dose, the patient is erythroblastopenic. If you give this very, very little dose, the patient has normal level of hemoglobin. In adult, it's most of the case, you do need more steroids to have a good response. And uh, we consider that the maximal uh, tolerable dose for a very long time to give for years is 10 milligrams per day, but it may be a matter of discussion with the patient. And lastly, you have, a, sorry, at least 20% of patients who are free of treatment, but at a very moment, uh, the patient may stay free of treatment for decades and after at 45 years, 50 years, it will become anemic again. This is an example in an adult patient. This is uh, the mother of a child uh, I follow and we have identified a mutation in uh, both. So the mother was first classified as silent carrier. And then she get cancer and uh, very unexpectedly, she need transfusion support during the chemotherapy, which was not usual for the oncologist. And then she need uh, transfusion for two years after the end of the treatment. And uh, at that time, the oncologist was not very fan uh, with of steroids. So we wait uh, the okay of the uh, oncologist. And finally we start a steroid and she had a very good response. We start at a higher dose and then finally we taper the dose. And at 10 milligram uh, per day, she has normal level of hemoglobin. And you see when we tried to use a small dose, she had a relapse of anemia. So we give her a 40 milligram only for one week with a good answer. And now we are trying to taper again, but milligram per milligram. I do not know if this patient will be able to get, to be again free of any treatment, but even uh, at that moment, 10 milligram per day, it's much better than uh, transfusion support, obviously. So this is the, why we don't like to speak about silent care. I think you have to speak about a patient with no phenotype, actually, currently, 
but maybe at the end it will have a phenotype. Uh, the other point uh, in adult in uh, is the RN uh, loading, which is very quick and very severe in DBA patient. We know that uh, if you compare DBA with other red cell disease, you have a much more severe uh, RN loading. And it, this is explained in part by the fact that the erythron is free of uh, red cell and red cell progenitors. So you have no a stock of iron in the bone marrow. Nevertheless, you have to be very cautious on that and uh, to give optimal uh, chelation therapy. I think that at least one third of patients need a combination of two chelators if you want to control really uh, the iron loading. And the only thing which is particular in DBA patient is that you have a very high risk of uh, agranulocytosis with deferiprone. So this agent must be used only in front line and if you have no other uh, option. Uh, for the for patient on steroid, uh, DBA is really uh, unique because it's the only uh, disease in human in which you can have steroid for 50 years, for instance. Some patients are treated uh, at the age of one year and 50 years after, they are still on steroids. So you have to look at steroid associated uh, toxicity very closely. And uh, you have also to look to the efficacy because uh, actually in many adult patients, you, you, you have a kind of premature aging of a bone marrow uh, and the patient became less responsive to steroids. So you have to give higher dose and at what moment it will be difficult to stay uh, on steroids and maybe the best option for the patient is to go back to transfusion. Do we have other therapeutic approach? Uh, Leucine is interesting because uh, we have some uh, benefit to use leucine, but uh, mostly in children regarding the growth and the general status and so on. If you look at hematological response, we have actually very few patients with a response. Maybe the best candidates are patient responsive to steroid, but with either a too much high dose or too low level of hemoglobin. And you, you want both to improve the level of hemoglobin and to reduce the steroid. And in some of these patients, you may have a synergy between leucine and steroid, and it may be interesting to try leucine. Leucine is really non-toxic. Uh, you have uh, to, to give it uh, three times a day, which is not so convenient. Some patients have uh, intestinal problem, but not so many. I think if a patient asks you to do or to improve his situation, you can propose this, but uh, in my hands, uh, the chance to have a response maybe is 10% at max. So why not? But uh, once again, it's maybe more interesting in children. Uh, Metoclopramide, you know, we, we had a paper in uh, blood. Uh, it was my, uh, my boss at the time. And then I did a clinical trial in adult patient with no response in 30 patients. So it was very disappointing. I think we did a mistake, that's mean to consider only a patient on transfusions. It's more or less like leucine. If you, I, I have, since that study, a few patients with a good response to steroid, and when you give a metoclopramide, you may improve the response. But it's much difficult to give for a very long time because we don't have many data to say that you can give this drug for years. And for instance, the, pa the patient I spoke to you before, after a few years of metoclopramide, he did add some motor problem and, and we had to stop metoclopramide and by luck, the response uh, stayed correctly. It has normal level of hemoglobin. So it's a discussion also, it's uh, not very people, not much people use this drug by now. Bone marrow transplant is less likely to be very toxic in adult patient. We, have, we know we have poor result, even in children. If you look at this paper we published recently in Blood Advance, uh, the, the limit age for a very good outcome is 10 years. So you can imagine that in a 
adult patient is worse. And if you look at the result here, you saw you see that uh, the results are less good when the age, uh, for instance, in adolescence, the overall survival is only 75 percent. This is not so much for benign disease. So uh, we consider bone marrow transplant in every ch child with cortical resistance, uh, for instance, but in adult patient, I think there are very few indication for transplant. The only one may be a clonal event, a myelodysplasia or a myeloid leukemia in a patient not so old and able to, uh, to go on uh, transplant procedures. And lastly, we have currently three teams, three groups who are working on uh, gene therapy for RPS-19. And uh, we don't know for at that moment if adults uh, will be candidate for this, but it's possible. What are the clinical outso outcomes in adult DBA patients? If you look at the hematology part, you may have more severe anemia, for instance, a patient with need more transfusion or a loss of response to steroid. Uh, leukoneutropenia is quite frequent in adults, but uh, in most of the case, no clinically relevant. I don't have in mind one patient with a severe infectious disease, for instance, due to neutropenia. In most of the case, uh, neutropenia is moderate without uh, clinical impact. Uh, when the question of over overall bone marrow failure for me, the answer is no, except if you look at the bone marrow biopsy, and you, you may be very afraid of the result of a bone marrow biopsy, but if you don't have this result, there is no problem. No, I never see a DBA patient with aplastic anemia. And the main point is uh, MDS and uh, leukemia, and uh, there is a very high risk in this population. If you look at this uh, paper by the US group, uh, the ratio is very high compared to the general population. And if you are very pessimistic, you can say that every DBA patient will have one day uh, MDS, but we don't have so many data at the moment. Uh, lastly, it's a difficult diagnosis because if you show a bone marrow aspiration slide to a cytologist who do not know a lot about DBA, he will be able to say, okay, this is a, a MDS, but actually it's just DBA. So to say that it's a, uh, true MDS, you may rely of blast excess, obviously, and if not, of on cytogenetics and molecular analysis. So the current recommendation is to do blood counts every three months with reticulocytes, and, and warning events are thrombocytopenia, which is rare, and uh, also a paradoxal rise in reticulocytes. Do we have to do sequential bone marrow respiration? Uh, for the moment, there is no demonstrated uh, clinical benefits, but maybe this can be considered for a patient uh, who is fit enough to go eventually to transplantation. The other point is the risk of solid tumors, and this is the first paper on that topic, once again by the American group. And uh, in this first publication, they spoke about a risk, a cumulative incidence of 20% by the age of 46 years. Uh, the other point has very, very different solid tumor types. That means it's not so difficult, easy to uh, have a screening, uh, adequate screening. Uh, this is the kind of result they had. So the most at risk uh, for solid tumors are adenocarcinoma of the colon and uh, osteosarcoma. But as you can see, many different uh, solid tumors with very low number of patients. So it's very difficult to have statistic on very low number. They did a second report uh, more recently and uh, they confirmed that two uh, solid tumors are clearly at very high risk. Once again, uh, colon cancer and uh, osteosarcoma. Uh, the median age at first cancer was 45 years. Uh, and this is young if you compare to general population. And the cumulative incidence of solid tumors by the age of 45 was 30%. So the, the question by now is, do we have to screen for cancer in DBA patient? Uh, once again, the problem is we have many different solid tumors. 
Uh, at the minimum, you have to give this information for patient, for family support group, and for a familial physician. And you, you have to say to your patient that he has to strictly follow any kind of measure given for the general population. Do we have to do a specific screening? Uh, currently, we are really discussing about coloscopy every five years uh, from the age of 25, like in over a uh, genetic uh, syndrome for in which the patients are prone to colic cancer. Personally, I began to do this in my patient. Uh, regarding immunology, once again, you may have a hypogamma globulinemia and the clinical uh, feature are more or less the one of common variable deficiency. Uh, nevertheless, even if you have very low uh, IG level, we do not have so many problems. Uh, you, you may also have some lymphopenia uh, in patient or steroids or not. So the current recommendation are to uh, do at least yearly uh, one immunological uh, evaluation. And uh, in a patient with very low uh, IG level, you have to consider immunization against uh, pneumococcal and uh, meningococcal uh, infection. This is an example of a patient. As you can see, the level of IgG are very, very low, also for IgE and IgE. And she is also very lymphocytopenic. Uh, this patient has a small dose of steroids. And considering this kind of uh, result, uh, I give to this patient a cotrimoxazole prophylaxis and uh, I give some additional vaccination in order to protect, to protect him. Uh, I did also a lung scan because you may have some kind of occult disease. And if you have a very severe result at the scan evaluation, this means that you need to give him uh, IG supplementation. So you give IG supplementation for a patient with recurrent infection or very severe or severe result at the lung, disease, lung scan uh, evaluation. Regarding a patient on transfusion, uh, once again, you have to look at the quality of life. This is very important. And in some patients, you have to rise the threshold and the patient say, okay, if I want to work normally and so on, now I need to be at least 10 grams of hemoglobins and you have to give him this possibility. Once again, you have to look very precisely at the, at the iron loading. So to you have six, look at sequential level of ferritins and every also to MRI evaluation. I, I practice every 12 to 24 months according to the level of the iron burden of the patient. You have to do a, a standard evaluation of hemochromatosis, especially for uh, hormones and so on. This is not specific of DBA. And you have also to look on uh, character toxicities. The current recommendation is to have normal level uh, of iron in uh, at the MRI evaluation. And this is possible. I will show you an example. Uh, and you, you need also very low level of ferritin. Uh, and it must, in my practice, it's better, it's better this kind of result, 300 to 500 uh, microgram per liter. Uh, you have to note that even in a patient with a very, very good control of uh, iron loading, the transferrin saturation will be in the 80 to 100% range. And that means you have free iron in the blood, and this is very toxic. So the best is to give a chelator any day. If you have, for example, a combination of two chelators, you have to do the way to give a chelator each day of the week. And it's the best way to control this uh, NTBI. The other point is if you have in that kind of range of ferritin level, you have a risk of hyperchelation. And uh, most of the chelators are more toxic for low ferritin level. And this is especially for case for deferacirox. When the ferritin is very low, you have a risk for tubulopathy. And a good screening test for tubulopathy is to look at the phosphoremia. And you have also a risk for urinary uh, lithiasis. And you have to do some evaluation every three years, for instance, to look, to look for lithiasis. 
This is an example of a good result in a patient. The, the first time I see this patient, she was adult and uh, actually she stopped any chelation for years. She was on transfusion, but she stopped any chelation. And uh, as you can see, the ferritin level was very high and it was, I think, the on, only clinical diagnosis of uh, hypothyroidism I made in an adult patient, which is not very current for uh, pediatric hematologist. The liver concentration was very high. It's given uh, in the microgram per uh, gram of liver. But that's mean a very, very high level. And the, also there is a cardiac uh, iron overload with a decrease of uh, relaxation at T2 star. And as you can see here, we managed, we tried to manage to find the best scalation for the patient. It was, it was quite difficult. She had toxicity with uh, deferacirox, but so finally we tried to give him a deferiprin, but she had agranulocytosis. So we come back to mostly to desferal and low level of deferacirox. And finally, the things were better and better. And at the end, she had normal uh, liver uh, iron. It was, Actually, low level of iron level regarding normal values, normal uh, earth evaluation, and currently she still has very good result and the chelation is less, much less intensive. So you can do in every in every patient you can have a good result of uh, chelation, but you have to be very active on that, and you need the help of your patient. For patient of prednisone, once again, you have to check for the efficacy because with aging, you may have a loss of response. And at what moment, very often, you have to discuss with him of the benefits risk ratio for steroids, idos, and transfusion. And also, obviously, you have to check for any kind of steroid toxicity because it's a very unique situation. And uh, event, if you do the best, you will have osteoporosis regarding the very long time duration of the treatment. Regarding pregnancy, uh, we did this paper with a German group and uh, pregnancies in DBA women are difficult. So the first point is you can give, uh, you cannot give any chelator during pregnancy. So if you have to manage the iron loading before the pregnancy at, the, at best, you need a high level calf maternity. You have to maintain the hemoglobin level upon 10.5 gram per deciliter. This is the result obtained in thalassemic women. We have good study for that. So in most of the patients that you mean to go on a hyper transfusion program in order to maintain hemoglobin level at a high level in the woman and you can eventually discuss uh, aspirins. Our current results are much more good uh, for now years and any DBR woman uh, with pregnancy had good outcome applying this uh, hypertransfusion regimen during the pregnancy, this is the main point. And uh, lastly, uh, if you consider the genetic counseling, it's quite a difficult task in DBA. Uh, obviously, you have to say that the risk is about 50% because it's in most of the case, the, the disease is autosomic dominant. But the problem is that there is no absolute uh, genotype phenotype correlation, including in a very family. So if you have, a, for instance, a woman with a very, very mild uh, DBR phenotype, no congenital uh, abnormalities, very good response to steroids, you cannot say that the child will be the same. The, ch the child may have a much more severe disease regarding both the hematological and non-hematological uh, phenotypes. So we have to be very cautious. There is no evidence so far of genetic anticipation. And uh, lastly, you have to discuss a medically assisted procreation in every uh, patient who want to discuss this. So the take a message to conclude is uh, DBA is not only a pediatric disease and uh, may be diagnosed in adult patient. And, uh, Actually, we have more and more diagnosis in DBA patients. That means the, the knowledge of this disease in the adult doctors are now much more better than it used to be. The DBA phenotype in adults remains in part to be described. We don't have a lot of publication. Actually, I think that the only publication of a group of adult DBA patients is the paper I show you on pregnancy. We don't have any other publication at that moment. Uh, 
DBA, it's a disease with premature aging of the bone marrow. So you have a big risk of myelodysplastic evolution. DBA must now to be known as a cancer prone disease. And we are working at the international level of new clinical guidelines in order to address this problem. And uh, lastly, once again, genetic counseling is quite difficult in DBA patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Leblanc. I only can echo the positive feedback already written in the chat. Thank you for this excellent talk. So I can see we have already two questions. So first questions, how do you explain how leucine or meclopropamine is working? Regarding leucine, you know, leucine is a very important amino acid for translation. And uh, you have a deficit of translation in a DBA patient. And that's, that's the reason why a Czech colleague tried to use leucine with good result. And since this first clinical uh, study, very limited clinical study, with only one child we did have a response on hematological point of view. We have evidence in uh, animal models. So the, we, f- we think mostly but that because it's uh, helped to translation uh, and protein synthesis, which is a defi- which have a deficit in uh, DBA. Regarding metoclopramide, uh, it's the easiest drug to induce hyperprolactinemia. Uh, in patients with hyper prolactinemia, you may have a bone marrow answer. And the, the first very case was a, a DBA woman who improved his hemoglobin level during pregnancy and lactation. And this is the reason why uh, Janet Apkovic uh, tried to uh, decide to use uh, this drug in DBA. And this was the first paper in, in blood with about 30% of good response, which was very attractive. But we, and we have a few cases reported by now with good results also uh, in, uh, in DBA. What is the risk about b- breast cancer? Well, f- for the moment, it's not established. But it's not, uh, we don't have enough data to say that the risk is significantly high. But for instance, in the French registry, we have two patients with uh, breast cancer, about uh, 500 patients, more or less, who are registered. So it's not... Uh, clearly significant at the moment. May, it may be one of the uh, solid tumor you can see in DBA patient. Once again, the, the much more evident is colic cancer and osteosarcoma. For instance, in the French DBA group, we have five uh, adolescents with osteosarcoma. And osteosarcoma, it's a very rare tumor. So to have five patients with uh, Osteosarcoma is not uh, standard. Uh, what is the expected timing for the first clinical trials on gen therapy? Uh, so we have, to my knowledge, there are three groups who are working on that cu- currently. One is a European group, led by the Spanish team, who had a success of gen therapy, gen therapy in Franconia anemia patients. Uh, we have. We are at the preclinical level, and we expect to have a clinical trial within two to three years. Uh, there is also a group in St. Jude. I don't know uh, what they are ready for. And maybe the first one will be a group led by this Swedish group. And they, I think they have a collaboration with other people, and maybe we will we'll have a uh, a clinical trials within uh, one or two years. So it's very difficult to say it, uh, to a patient, you have to wait for the moment because we may have a gen therapy at what moment. Obviously, it will be only for RPS-19 patients. So all the rest of patients yeah, will be uh, later, later on. And uh, we don't know really if uh, we are going to use or not uh, bone marrow conditioning. We don't know for the moment if we are will be able to treat both children and adult patients. So it's a very speculative still at the moment. Uh, I, I answer the question of uh, gen therapy in young children and adults, maybe in adults, but for the moment, we are not sure of that. Uh, regarding the question of uh, DBA patient with osteosarcoma, I think uh, we don't have clearly, but I think um, mostly difficult case, but the most uh, important point is the fact to have a 
unusual chemotoxicity and eventually very long bone marrow aplasia and very severe bone marrow aplasia. So I think the, the true message is if you have a child and you are treating this child for osteosarcoma and he had a very severe and unexpected bone marrow toxicity, you do have to think to DBA by now because I think obviously it's one of the possibilities. And for instance, osteosarcoma is not reported in Franconiademia patient. So you, it's specifically a problem with DBA. How to explain hematological remission in DBA patient is not really well understood. We have very few examples of somatic, somatic reversion, like, like reported in Franconia anemia patient, for instance. We have a few cases published, but very few. And uh, we can have uh, hematological remission mostly at two times. In very young children, for instance, less than one year, the child receives two to three transfusion, and then he gets to remission with normal level hemoglobins for years or for decades. And also we can see this at the puberty. And uh, currently we have more and more uh, adult patients and the hematologist call me saying, okay, this child said me that, uh, of, uh, this patient said me that when he was a child, he needs support to transfusion or steroids and so on. V then he was okay and now he's anemic again. And I, I think this is a problem of uh, bone marrow aging. So you may have a remission for 10 years, 20 years, and then you are again anemic. And uh, regarding the explanation, we don't have, we don't have any. Uh, I have a, a patient, for instance, she, had, uh, she was for transfusion for a year. She had a septic shock. She was a very, very severe disease in, uh, in uh, intensive care for two months. And during that time, she recovered uh, erythropoiesis for three months, and then she come back to be anemic and to need transfusion. So you can see this kind of event, and we don't have uh, clearly uh, many expectations. Uh, regarding erythropoietin, uh, it's not active, at least in children. I think this is clear enough. If you have a patient with a mild anemia, some hematologists want to treat uh, the patient with erythropoietin. I'm not sure we have very convinced a result. In most of the cases, there is no result at all. Once again, the level of EPO is very, very high in DBA. So it's not very logical to give EPO. If you want to try in an adult patient with mild anemia, why not? It's not uh, very toxic and so on, but we don't have uh, any evidence. We good result. Uh, maybe I missed, it. I missed it, but is there a place for Luspatercept? No, the answer is not. We have a try, uh, we, we try to, uh, to build a clinical trial for that, but the results are disappointing and for the, we don't have published results. So, but I think the answer is not. It's too, it's uh, too late. Uh, if you consider the pathology of, uh, of uh, DBA, it was okay for, uh, mild thalassemic syndrome, for instance, but DBA is a different situation. So no result with a drug, with, with this drug. So I, I think your presentation and then the questions were very comprehensive and uh, it has been a very fruitful talk. So uh, let me thank you again, Professor Leblanc and see all of you to our next Thursday webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joel. <laughs>